welcome everyone. Uh, I'm hoping we are live and we are going forward with the rest of Pride in Education. If you've been watching since Friday, I hope you've been enjoying it. What an amazing uh, event that we've got set up and how many great panellists have we got. It's amazing. Talking of great panellists, welcome to the whole, whole workplace approach. Here. We're going to start talking about what we can do in schools, what we can do in the workplace to sit, carry on with inclusion uh, and continue. And I've got some really great panellists that are going to be part of this event today, including myself. I'm actually not just hosting today, I'm going to do, just give you a bit of information about my work and some of the stuff I do with my everyday pride training. So what I'm going to start doing now is I'm going to share my screen. And this is where you, everyone gets a bit worried about tech. What's happening? Is it going to get, be all right on the night, as they say? So I'm going to ask my panellists to give me the thumbs up to say, can you see my... Um, yeah, perfect, Saski. Thank you. Perfect. Fabulous. So I'm just going to start off with myself uh, and say hello everyone, I'm, I'm Saski. Um, many of you might know various stuff I do uh, for the LGBTQ plus community, but I also do inclusion training, whether that's in schools or in the workplace, LGBTQ plus inclusion training. Uh, and the training that I offer myself is called Everyday Pride Training. Today I'm just going to give you a quick drive through, just to give a bit of a taste session of some of the things I do. But I've just put my flyer up first to start, because I just want you to get an idea of actually what Everyday Pride means to me and what it's about. And as you can see, it's about people, respect, inclusion, diversity and equality. But often when I work with schools or in the workplace, people don't really know where to start. So we always offer kind of bespoke training. And you can see uh, along the line that we've got a list of different types of training that I offer. Um, and, and often what I say, the main thing I want people to come away with is confidence. So you can update the policies, you can update, you know, you can make change within the workplace, but actually I want you to have that confidence in conversation because if we can't have confidence in conversation, then actually we're not really gonna get very far. And a lot of that really is around language, language and understanding. When we're talking about the LGBTQ plus community in particular, particular language around sexual orientation uh, and gender identity. Um, the idea with my training is that it is about, you know, making that change between policy and principle because the principle of pride is about everyone being able to be their true authentic self. So when we're thinking about being your true authentic self, whether that's in schools, in the workplace, it should be anywhere. So whether it's at home, school, workplace, with your friends, your family, it's really about taking that mask off and just being able to be who you are in any environment. I'm just gonna move on to my, my next slide, which I told you, Lila, this would happen. The next slide, let's go. Don't worry, people stay with me. We're thinking about the benefits and the aims and the purposes of this. And really, like I say, it is about empowering your staff to make sure that they feel confident and comfortable in having better communication. Um, it's about making sure that your, as I say, your policies are updated. It's about making sure that people feel that they can be themselves and be comfortable in who they are. But also we don't just have pride or inclusion for the LGBTQ plus community. It's about making sure that we've got pride for everyone. So it's allies as well. So I'm gonna move forward and just quickly cover our agenda. So even though my training is bespoke, if you just take a little look at this agenda, typically it's this what we'll be covering. So thinking about creating positive conversations around sexual orientation uh, and gender identity, particularly focused also on pronouns and the importance of pronouns. Um, again, pronouns are something that we all have. It's not just about people who are trans, non-binary and gender diverse. However, it is important that we respect uh, people from the trans, non-binary, gender diverse communities and make sure that whoever we're talking to, whoever we're uh, communicating with, that we make sure that we use the pronouns that that person uses for themselves. It's about respect on both ways so it's for everyone. Um, how do we tackle homophobic, biophobic uh, and transphobic incidents in the workplace? So giving you updates around that. Understanding also discrimination and how to tackle it. Again, I think often people may say things not even realise actually if they're experiencing discrimination, how do I report it? Or even about having the confidence to be able to report it as well and understanding uh, the roots and the journey and why they should do that. Uh, thinking also about how we can create inclusion for LGBTQ plus people in the workplace. Again, uh, it's about updating your policies, about having better conversations and what we can do to work together as a team. And also my favourite part of this is allies. And if you're part of the LGBTQ plus community, who does not know the song, we want you as a new recruit? So that's what we want for our allies as well. Allies, it's not just about us, it's about you too. This is just a typical slide of what you'll see when we're talking about language. Um, so thinking again about understanding sexual orientation and gender identity. So what I'll do is I'll break down what certain words mean, what terms in, uh, mean within the LGBTQ plus uh, umbrella uh, identities as well. 
And I'll get, the, I'll get people to understand again that sexual orientation isn't something that we choose. The only thing that we really choose in that is whether we come out about it. And that's the same with our gender identity. So thinking about language and getting people confident about using language as well. And you know what? Getting people to say out loud, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender. No one's arms fall off. It's okay. It's safe. So we can talk about that. Um, another thing, I'm conscious of time here. So again, we'll be going through pronouns and understanding the importance of pronouns. That's binary and gender neutral pronouns um, as well. And then, as I say, we'll be kicking off with the power of allyship. So leaving you, all of us as allies, thinking about making yourself aware of allyship. So educating yourself and then listening and learning, understanding you know, the importance. Why are you an ally and why is it important? leveraging your privilege so we all have a privilege some people have more privilege than others but what have you got what can you use to make your workplace more inclusive as well and with that you are empowering yourself to be more confident to tackle uh, discrimination as and when it happens and also to support others to do that as well because even about being an ally you know that's about making sure that we do that as a team too so we can be individual allies but we should be allies as a team and we always have to remember before i close that discrimination affects us all and it's something that we should all work together so it's important that we all join forces and make that positive change so i've timed myself i'm 20 seconds over i'm going to stop and i'm going to move on so i'm going to stop sharing there now all i will just say is that if you want to find out a bit more about that um, that was your drive through, but you can contact me at saski.co.uk or you can find me on social media, but drop me a line and I'll be happy to speak with you about how we can help make your workplace more inclusive as well. So that's me done. Let me hand over to my fabulous panellists um, and I can see my first one. So um, can I just bring, uh, ask Andy if you won't mind unmuting yourself there for me, please. Hello. Hello, Andy. Good morning. Good morning. We're short for time. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to let you, you continue, introduce yourself, give us a bit, of, uh, a bit of an intro on yourself and then take it away. Thank you very much, Saski. I'm very, very pleased and humbled to be here. Uh, wonderful presentations. Um, my name is Anbit. I am uh, based in Cologne, Germany. I relocated myself five years ago to, to protect my life. Uh, I was living in Bangladesh. As an LGBT activist, um, and uh, since uh, the beginning of this year, I uh, started working for the Ministry of Children, Family, uh, Youth, Integration and Migration as an expert on LGBTI and migration to provide uh, and also conceptualize uh, qualification courses, uh, professional courses to social workers who are dealing with LGBTI refugees. Um, Often working uh, with uh, social workers who are supporting LGBTI uh, refugees, the idea of roles and responsibilities of, uh, of social workers are often not um, well performed because of prejudices um, and um, pre-existing ideas about LGBT people um, and not being able to have any space where colleagues or even with the director of the refugee center or any social um social um uh, organization um they don't have the access to have a discussion and conversation that's why it's really important that we have clear and visible support and commitment uh for lgbt inclusion from the leadership uh which happened for instance um when uh, vatican city uh said that homosexual couples cannot be blessed and many organizations uh and catholic churches like mostly Catholic organizations are providing um, big number of, uh, have big number of social workers to provide services to people. And having rainbow flags was a clear symbol that LGBTI inclusion um, is, is actually something they are also thinking of and are committed to. Um, often having these discussions, uh, talking about LGBTI or sexual orientation and gender identity itself, is not often enough. And I think that's why I have included in, 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 in the conception of the, of the workshop to talk about violence and discrimination and where it comes from. It's not just about direct violence, but also violences uh, which are structural and furthermore cultural, uh, which has to do with history of uh, longer lasting patriarchy um, and also uh, racism, um, sexism and all that and how people who are getting the, the, the courses are also able to identify who are the people responsible for this injustice and how to tackle that. 
um, it's, 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 it, it comes to the point to really empower the person uh, to, to take the position where they are able to do their um, job well and also not see the person as a beneficiary, just, oh, this person need this, but also see the person at, in, in a whole picture. And I remember having a conversation uh, with the job center and calling them up and being like, would you like to have um, a sensitization course or something for your colleagues? And they're like, well, when we talk about jobs, uh, we only see people and their skills. And, um, and I think, and I told them, um, if you only see your uh, workers as skills, then you actually think about them as algorithms and programs. And, and but we are people working in, in the system and you have to also acknowledge not just their sexual orientation and gender identity, but also their skin color, their uh, disabilities, mental health issues, income, or um, and, and, and many others. So I think having an intersectional approach in, in the whole organizational approach is really, really important to think about. Um, I will go on, continue blabbering. I, I would like to give the floor to someone else. Thank you. <laughs> uh, you're certainly not blabbering. Thank you very much, uh, Andy. Thank you so much for that. Uh, but it is really true, we really have to uh, take into account intersectionality all the time, don't we? Because, you know, that's who we are, that's a big makeup of everyone within society. And I think also when you think about the Equality Act, you know, with the nine protected characteristics, obviously in the UK, I know you're, you're not in the UK, but for us here in the UK, you know, we, we're all actually related to those characteristics one way or another, some more, some less. Um, so absolutely intersectionality plays a massive part. Uh, in inclusion and understanding identities as well. Um, so, you know, that's, that's um, a really good good point there. Thank you so much. And in, in terms of your work, is there anywhere where people can find you or follow you or find out more about what you're doing? Um, beside Instagram, you could also email me um, at unbidsaman at gmail.com. Uh, that's my private email. Thank you. Stuff. Thank you. I'm sure Lyle has also got that there, um, your information ready. So thank you so much. So. Next up, we have, from a school's perspective directly as well, which I think this is really important, Bex, welcome. Very good morning to you. Hi, Saski. Thank Hi. you very much for having me as part of this. Oh, no problem. Listen, we appreciate everyone taking part. It is, it's not just a whole school approach, whole workplace approach, it's a whole community approach, isn't it? So thank you for joining us, us too. Uh, and obviously that's globally, thankfully, as well. Um, thank you for giving us your time. You've got a presentation that you're, you're going to be um, showing, and I think... The presentation is pre-recorded, isn't it? So yep. when that comes through, what we'll be asking the audience as well um, is if we can, um, if you want to put any questions, put them in the box and then answer. I can see a couple of questions that's coming that I'll, I'll, I'll come back to you at the end of this panel. Um, but Lila, I believe you have the video ready. Um, do you want to just do, before we get that video up, um, I can't remember in your video, do you have an intro about your school? Do you want to just say the name of your school in terms of, or should we just... Yeah. A little bit. I do. I do say have they got the intro as part of the school. I'm happy to answer questions during the video as well. Um, I'm Bex. I'm from Midlands Pedalbury's Trust, Heath Lane. Um, but it, it probably says it all in the video, so I'm happy to go straight to that if you like. Let's do it. We'll do it. We look at people could put questions in the uh, chat box, and we'll answer if they come through as we go. But Lila, we're ready when you are. I can. I can. I can share. I'm ready to share if you want. Well, you have it. Let's do this. <laughs> World, we're loving it. Good morning, and my name's Bex. I'm from Midlands Academies Trust, and I'm talking about establishing a positive environment for LGBT identities and allies. Um, I'm from the Trust, and it, it comprises of four secondary academies which sit on the North Warwickshire Leicestershire border. My school just sits into the county of Leicestershire and has about 587 pupils within it. Um, in a constantly changing world, though, like all schools, it's historically relied on the endeavours of committed and dedicated staff, one's willing to ensure that equality and diversity is not just a tick box exercise or written mention in paperwork policies and procedures. We're committed to just celebrating a diversity, LGBT qualities, about doing what's right. And it's very much born from kindness at Teeth Lane Academy. <clears throat> a brief personal history for you. In 1995, aged 15, I requested and held meetings with my then principal to discuss Section 28. Um, it was because I wasn't happy about the impact in my school at the time and our school's lack of action on it. I've now been teaching for 13, 14 years, but prior to this, I've always worked with young people, mostly from disadvantaged backgrounds in uh, youth group centres, schools, festivals, community centres, and even one high street at one time. I've been an activist at uh, Pride Birmingham since 2001, and active nationally at Prides throughout that time. 
and was the founder, chairperson, project manager of a grassroots group called Art Pride that was creative growth opportunities for LGBT women. Raised over £20,000 um, for grassroots groups and organisations, always being at a community level. But having to escape prejudice, discrimination and abuse myself, having lost two jobs due to my sexuality and gender, found myself homeless and a third time survivor of physical attacks, assault and abuse, of um, often having to represent myself in court as well. So starting off, I was thinking about how I could make a difference. I was just one person. I started very, very small and built very, very slowly. Starting with my um, union, they've been very supportive of my activi activism uh, in the CWT. But I have marched and promoted a variety of courses within Pride Parades for many years and attended many TUC LGBT conferences, both a delegate and a speaker. And it was there that I started to meet people like um, Sue Sanders. I've been voted into the LGBT plus and ECWT National Advisory Committee and various local association and federation roles for equality and diversity and attended consultation conferences from my union and involvement in both Ukiah and Stonewall workshops workshops those really kind of what started the, the chain reaction of activism for me what did our, our journey look like really at Heath Lane though well it very much started with discussions with the principal and a business case I wrote that I put to the board of governors and that discussions happened quite in depth with governors addressing their needs what did they need what were their questions we then had an afternoon tea with potential students what did they want what would make, make a difference to them and we then started the group up Thinking about group rules, focus, name, purpose, flags for allies, flags for LGBT identifying people, and then had a, a, uh, implemented a whole school question box uh, that was anonymous and the answers which went into um, a school bulletin. We implemented non-uniform days and assemblies to celebrate LGBT History Month and um, created equality ambassadors who were both allies and LGBT identifying. We reviewed whole school policy had further non-uniform days, assemblies, and developed a really embedded that ethos. That's not to say we didn't experience resistance, um, etc., in school, but we were fully supported at all times by the head, so we were very lucky. What happened? How did it bear fruit? We've got a quality of in school, which is going to be its, um, soon uh, identified with uh, unicorn pin badges. We started having much wider conversations with students, staff during break, lunch time, during lesson time and during prep, which is our form time. We had the largest amount of money raised on any non-uniform day. And that's an ongoing yearly event for LGBT charities as well. And yearly recognition of that as well as Ida Hobbit. And a, and a steering group has been established across the whole mat as well. So it's fantastic. We really want to um, embed that um, in the future, really develop that, that steering group. Possibly look at Stonewall Champions Datas, possibly. Really cross-fertilise those successful strategies across the academies and embed you know, LGBT plus firmly within equality and diversity so it's what real staying power and isn't staff dependent. Ensure longer term curriculum development across the trust, both knowledge curriculum base as well as the pastoral and extracurricular side, which is also important. And then make decisions about how we're going to audit and quality assure that. Looking then out to other organisations, establishments and other schools. Thank you very much for listening. I know that was very quickly. If you do have any questions, though, please do ask them in the chat. Thank you so much for listening, everyone. Thank you. I hope that was OK and everyone could hear it. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, it was. That was great. Thank you. Gosh, um, Beth, it was a bit fast. No, well, that well, this, unfortunately, we're short for time, aren't we? But my gosh, what a journey for yourself, you know, oh. personal journey. Um, and, and look how far you've come. You must feel really proud of yourself, you know, considering how that kind of started. Um, it just cut out for a minute. I'm really sorry. <laughs> I don't know why. It's all right. I was just saying, you know, your personal journey, you, I mean, you, wow. I mean, you must feel really proud considering everything that you've been through to where you're at now, you know. And, and yeah. That, you know. I find it really strange when people say that, though, because it is obviously like, my journey's been going on for a really long time so <laughs> I'm 41 now um yeah I don't feel like I've really done anything which is kind of a bit bizarre isn't it but uh I just because you always like looking to the next thing you, you don't really look back you kind of it's not until you do something like this and you go oh yes I did this and oh yes I did that and do you remember we did this and it's not until you maybe have to do a presentation or something or really talk about it that you actually kind of think about it all, I guess. It's quite a strange, but thank you. That's very humbling. And um, I, I feel very honored that you said that. And I feel a little bit sort of like, I don't deserve it, but thank you very much.
<laughs> well, you should you should feel like that. You do deserve it. And also, you know, like I say, um, unfortunately, your story is probably very similar to so many people within our community. So when we think about homophobia, biophobia, transphobia, and the real impact. So obviously, we're talking about pride in education, pride in schools, pride in the workplace. But I guess it's conferences like this and conversations like this that we need to continue having having to make sure that we are making those positive changes you know because Absolutely. it cannot continue can it although you know i feel like we're always saying we're still not quite there yet but this story has got to change and it's events like this people like yourselves and all of us making these changes uh, to, to, to bring those forward there's, so, there's so many people out there like me and we still need to save people's lives and you know get rid of the suffering and um you know do all of those things they still need to be done right now and it's it, it, it is like a life and death situation for so many people and yeah it's just like it, it is incredible but I won't take up any more valuable time I'll pass over <laughs> <laughs> yeah no it is well look it, all of our time is valuable in this and this is a valuable session so don't don't think like that it's all right but uh, thank you so much for everything you're doing and, and you, your students are just before we go on to the, our next uh, part of the panel your students must love you you do such great stuff <laughs> Yes, yes, but most of the time. <laughs> Until detention kicks in and then it's and like... there's cake and rainbow skittles and all that business, yes. <laughs> I'm still a teacher. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Don't try and smooth her too much. <laughs> um, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Um, so next part, I believe we've got the other Bex. So there's two Bex. There, there's two fabulous Bex on this uh, panel, people, just so you know. Uh, there's Bex, Bex with the KS and there's Bex with the X. <laughs> I'm going to hand over to Bex with the X first, I believe. So, hi, Bex, welcome. Hi, thanks for having me. No problem, no problem. Are you ready and raring to go for your? Program? Absolutely, bring it on. Really on, and I'm, I'm going to introduce Raina as well. Yeah. Raina, sorry, as well, because um, I know you're kind of doing two parts to this together, aren't you? Um, so, I've, I know you've also got a workshop that is happening. Uh, it's not straight. Off. Is it straight after? It's a little bit later, isn't it, in the session? But you can let us know. When that is so i'm just going to pass over over to you bex take it away brilliant thank you very much um this is me and rhino trying to be brief so this will be fun um so uh thanks for having us um my name's bex um i'm a history and politics teacher at a um, high school and sixth form in ipswich in suffolk rural suffolk um ipswich being you know the main town um, and we've decided to work together. Um, I'll let Rainer introduce himself quickly, actually. Um, do you want to introduce yourself, Rainer? Right, I can do now. I'm yeah, Rainer. Um, I'm Professor of Modern European History at the University of Essex, so one county removed from Suffolk. And I'm actually one of the dinosaurs in the room in that I not only remember the earth battles immediately after Stonewall, but was part of them. So essentially, we've decided to kind of come together and share with you, which we'll go through a lot of this in our workshop. I believe it's at three o'clock later today. It's three o'clock, um, yeah. Yeah, about um, how schools can actually work with universities and with academics to build a really LGBT knowledge rich curriculum and really give it that kind of legitimacy that it actually deserves. Um, so we've been kind of working together on that. So. A um, little plug for our workshop later where we'll give you some real treats and some real resources and we'll go into that in a bit more depth. But what we wanted to kind of talk about um, briefly now is kind of um, a little bit like um, Bex, the other Bex did, um, a little bit about kind of the organisation organizational approach and how do you actually get uh, your governors and your senior leaders on board um, and what are the barriers to this? So um, just to start off, um, I've worked in a few schools now and absolutely it definitely feels like, um, you know, if you are someone who has a protected characteristic, a member of staff who does, you tend to, you know, take that work on and lead um, that EDI work, that diversity work. And I think that's really important. So I think, you know, students need to belong, they need to see themselves reflected, particularly in the staff. Um, but sometimes that can feel like a really lonely place and it feels like, well, what's the point? Um, because actually I'm going to all of this training and my knowledge of LGBTQ is probably better than other people who don't have that lived experience. Um, and so sometimes that can feel futile. Um, 
So I want to kind of go through a couple of steps really briefly that, that our school took and where we're at. And we are by no means a finished product. I don't think anyone can really call themselves truly inclusive, actually. Um, so the first thing I think is to start with student voice. Um, do you have safe spaces in your school where you're actually listening to the lived experience of the students, their families and their communities? Because if you're not, then there's no way that your organisation are going to know where to start. Um, you won't know what language to use, you won't know how to best serve the communities um, within your organisation. Um, and so that's what we did. We set up many spaces. Um, Rhino works with the human rights group um, at our school, the Dora Love Project. Mm -hmm. Also, um, we'll talk more about that in the workshop. We have an LGBT group, a community and diversity group, um, and a forefront group as well. Um, and we conduct regular student voice in our history lessons, in all our subject lessons. But for me, there's no point doing student voice if the organization is not going to react to that or to use it or action it. And so for me, the next step was to try and get other staff on board. Um, and that's quite difficult. Um, you think everyone will be on board uh, because you're really friends, you know, you're friends with everyone at work and you think, oh, everyone will understand. Um, and actually what you have to think about is the different identities. We talked about intersectionality earlier, um, the different communities. And also, um, you know, generational um, ideas as well and, and ideas within communities and families. Um, and that can be a real barrier. So the first thing I would say is to identify who are your, you know, the people who are going to be on your team and they're really going to champion things. Um, and we'll talk more about that later. But once I've got a few staff members on board who are like, this is so important, the next step is really, we need to make sure that this is a top down approach. We need to get SLT on board, governors on board, because that's where things are really gonna have long-term legacy and change. Um, and for me, the th first thing to do was to take that student voice and uh, take that back to uh, SLT. Um, have you got your hand up, Saskia? I'm gonna make a bit of time. Because yeah, I'm, I'm gonna be, I like two minutes. Go, go, go. I got it, I got it. Um, <laughs> And um, yeah, so we went to SLT and we said, this needs to be part of the school improvement plan. And one of the big things I can say to you, uh, many people say the barriers are, how do you get SLT and governors involved? It can be quite scary LGBT education. And my argument is use the social justice case, make the social justice case and use the legal frameworks that we have, use the Equality Act, use the new RSHE uh, guidance and use safeguarding as well. Um, because are we safeguarding our children and LGBT education is definitely about that as well. If we're not providing that, then we are not safeguarding our children. Um, and so the other thing was obviously getting involved external organisations so that we bring that legitimacy to LGBT um, knowledge and curriculum. Um, but we'll talk a bit more about it in our workshop. We'll give you lots of ideas, specifics, resources. We'll have a good old chinwag in the workshop. Um, Thanks. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thanks. Rhino, we've literally got two questions in a couple of minutes left. So I know you've got a workshop coming up, but I'll give you, can give you a minute if you want. Yes, I want a minute and I want a minute in order to broaden the case. And this is also where I think academics come in. We live in increasingly volatile times and there have been rising attacks on the most palatable of LGBTQ plus organizations in the UK, namely Stonewall. And I think many have not yet realized in what dangerous times we live and that it needs a mobilizing effect and that teachers, schools, students, student led and academics at the university who are open to these ideas really need to work together uh, in order to stem the wave, which I fear is already going all over us. Um, and uh, my discussions that I've had with colleagues, but also with the LGBT community is that not everyone is actually realizing this. Small organizations are fearing for financial survival. So I am not wearing, can't really see it, any rainbow color. I'm wearing the pink triangle, the badge that gay men were forced to wear in the Nazi concentration camps. And this is to remind me and others that persecution is only one step away and that we are closer to the abyss than many of the talks that we have listened to, which are uplifting and we need uplifting news. 
but which many of the talks are not necessarily alluding at. We need broad coalitions beyond LGBTQ+, uh, because we are all affected by the rolling back of the times. If the human rights of one group are endangered or taken away, no group can or should feel safe. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank you so much. I'm really sorry because I will chat. We could carry on with this conversation all day. We're limited on time. We have a couple of questions quickly. Uh, one is the student, I think more to Bex maybe, the student equality ambassadors is a fantastic idea. What do your student equality ambassadors do across the school? I will tell you what they can do. Get them all involved. It's not just about LGBTQ+, it's about making allies. Uh, so understanding, this is what Ryan has said as well. Everybody is about, uh, you know, discrimination can affect us all, so it's all of our responsibility to tackle it. So it's, it should be allies of equality as opposed to just LGBTQ plus allies. But with your schools, um, Bex, I know that people may be able to contact you to get a bit more information about your school ambassador. Yeah, that's absolutely fine. No problem. Oh, me or the other Bex, I'm not sure, but sorry. Uh, or whoever, but you can get more information about that as well uh, from anyone. Contact me anytime because, um, yeah, about the equality ambassadors or, or anything else. I and mean, then they're not. They're not. They're certainly not LGBT identifying. They they are allies as well. They're people that have, the young people that have the confidence to to step up and be those. They do have training, um and um, um yeah, they're they're for people who don't want to speak to an adult as well. Which is we 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 identified as something through through people voice as something that was really important. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Grace. Another quick question: and um, how can we tackle? Uh, antiphobia, uh, since given that the uh, asexuality isn't covered uh, in the Equality Act 2010 in the UK. Um, <clears throat> to my understanding, I thought it was all uh, sexualities actually, but another part of that question, maybe we can continue. I think asexuality is something that we do need to, um, st there still needs more support and work under that, absolutely. Um, but I would say if your workplace is inclusive, if they are taking into account LGBTQ plus inclusion, then I would say absolutely that's a conversation that needs to uh, continue because it should be support for everyone. Um, Lila, I can see you there and I know that wasn't even a full proper answer to either question, but I would say that uh, they can come back to us for more information. I think our next panel is about to start, am I right? Yes, um, Sarah is saying gay sexuality is not part of the Equality Act and in Sarah's workshop this afternoon on embedding STEM, I think asexuality is covered because oh, as you will see in their bio, um, um, yes, and Bex, you are very welcome, Bex with a CKX to type the answer back <coughs> in the chat. <coughs> I'm losing my voice, sorry. I'm back. Saskia, you've done a phenomenal job. That was so expertly chaired and we've got very, very little time, but we just thought that was like a keynote and whole organizational approach has been touched upon on the other knowledge um, sharing um, panels um, and do register for Bex and Reiners. Uh, you've got close to an hour to really go in depth and ask questions and it's very, very interactive. I just want to thank you all so very, very much. Um, I'm going to promote you to um, delegates and uh, as if by magic, I think Sally, Lou and uh, Lou Cash will appear on your screen because they've all been promoted um, as panelists now. Thank you. So Lou Cash, Sally and Lou, welcome. Look at this, it's magic. I like Zoom, it's just so magic. <laughs> thank you so much. And thank you for having me as well. Um, this sounds like a very interesting discussion, but I was, <laughs> um, I just went straight in. Um, so uh, without further ado, I think I'll just get on with my um, bit. I'm Lucas, uh, my, uh, I'm pronounced Wukash, in proper pronunciation if you're interested. I work for Mosaic LGBT Plus Young Persons Trust in London. I'm wearing a gold embroidered top, um, just for the humbleness of it all. And I'm sitting on the background of a bookcase and a wall with some, well, communist propaganda posters, let's be honest. It's no better way of uh, dressing it up. Um, so I'll be going through the presentation in a minute. Um, when I describe the picture, it means that it has a picture. So, um, but if I'm just reading going through a presentation, it just means that just words that prompt my uh, points on it. So uh, please bear with. Uh, attempt sharing the screen now, you'll be happy to hear. Here we are, does this work? I can see you, Sally, can you nod? Um, it works. So welcome, welcome. 
uh, I'll be doing the first bit and then uh, Sally and Lou will be doing the second bit about sports, which I must say is very interesting. Um, I have an honor of talking about working with young LGBT plus young persons. So that's kind of what I'm going to be covering throughout this presentation. And that's what the first slide says. So the first things first, I like to always start from the learning pyramid. Uh, and that's the image that's being uh, on the screen at the moment. Uh, and pyramid consists of four levels. And the bottom level being the unconscious incompetence. So we don't know what we don't know. And it's okay for you to have that. Uh, and I think this is why people attend here. That's why they attend this wonderful conference, conference kind of enter the sphere, sphere of understanding and starting to explore what they need to know. When we start realizing we don't know something, then we are entering the phase, which is the second layer from the bottom, which is the conscious incompetence. And conscious incompetence means that we are aware that there are lacks in our knowledge, right? And therefore you, that might be a reason why you are here because you have identified that there's um, lack of understanding around inclusion of LGBT plus and persons in your work. Uh, so that might be the case. Well, when you start learning about things, that's the third layer, you enter conscious competence. And conscious competence is quite interesting because that's when you start learning to drive and you have to really think how to change a gear and how to steer and you know you have to do everything very manually it's very conscious effort um i should do this but i should know this because i failed driving license exam four times i'm pleased to tell you uh so i'm uh, licensed not to be safe on the roads but uh, nevertheless that can that's the phrase when we're mm. conscious competence and i think what we need to realize is that conscious competence will be uh, an aspect of our lgbt work it's okay to feel a bit self-conscious about it because that's new to us and that's okay like all equality work is constantly developing and we are supposed to be learning when you've done things for years and years and years and years you end up end up in a sphere which is the top of the pyramid which is the unconscious competence that means you can do things with your eyes closed someone can wake me up in the middle of the night halfway through my sleep and i'll know how to do lgbt plus in person's youth work because that's what you do um especially in residential school they'll know how that feels so unconscious competence comes at the top of the pyramid. Sometimes it can be quite dangerous to be constantly in unconscious competence. So we have processes to take it back and reflect and supervise and all the kind of processes that allow us to um, well enter back into our conscious competence and re-examine how we do things. So they are not always stagnant uh, and the same. So I'm showing this because it gives us a nice reference, a nice frame to realize that actually we will be somewhere on this pyramid and it's okay. Let's just accept the place where you are at. What I'm not going to be able to do is to take you from the bottom, so unconscious incompetence, all the way to the top into unconscious competence because people do PhDs in this. So, and this is a 15 minute presentation if I'm good in my timekeeping, which I have trialed and it did work, but I was slightly from because we are slightly behind, but I will be quick. If I do speak really fast, which I do have tendency of doing, um, can you wave if you can't like hear me anything? Sally and Lua can see you. So I count on you to be paces um, in case if I stop making sense. Um, so I wanted to just very briefly mention the mission of the organization. And there was a reason um, behind that madness. I think that's Shakespearean right there. You see blending in um, as a Polish immigrant. Um, support, educate and inspire, right? Because I think it's very important that we've realized of the missions organizations that we are in. So when we're lo looking at uh, inclusion of LGBT plus young persons in our workplaces, our organizations, our schools, uh, wherever it is that you're working. So it's a broad spectrum and the conference is quite uh, broadly applicable. Think about what is the mission of your organization. For us, it is to support, educate and inspire. And then everything else follows from that. The vision for our organization is proud, strong and cohesive LGBT plus organization that um, LGBT community that is making a difference is healthy and safe. Those are, th this is what, uh, we kind of stand for in terms of vision and the image that I'm showing on the screen is an image of our young persons marching in pride with the banner that reads Mosaic LGBT Youth Center, which is our previous uh, branding. We rebranded during pandemic because we felt the pandemic wasn't doing enough, enough work. Um, so, uh, you know, hey ho, it works. Um, Last thing I'm going to mention in this in this regard are values, because I think very often when I go to schools and I've spoken to many teachers, they're like, oh, you know, my senior leadership team is very supportive of this new idea that I want to do in my school. And that was one conversation specifically that I have had with one of the teachers. And when I was coming into the school, they had a banner 
which read their values and one of the values was equality. I'm like, why don't you just utilize this and you know, self-defense mode, uh, turn the tables. Our values are like this and hence I'm proposing that, um, which basically connects across. And I think very often when we have a common ground, it's about far more likely we're going to find understanding. For us, um, mosaic stands for being mindful of our impact, being open uh, to young persons in terms of being accessible, but also open to feedback. We're a safe environment for young persons to engage in. We're agile, so we're adapting to changing circumstances and needs of our members. Uh, we're inclusive of young persons and intersectionally so. And we're community focused um, because that is uh, a very important cornerstone of the work we do with our community, or, um, we're a community organization after all, LGBT community specifically. So we do, so out of that, we deliver several services. I'm just going to very briefly mention those. Um, and the images that will be on the screen um, on <laughs> nothing to look at, but um, they are generally kind of depicting the, the service that I'm talking about. So they are depicting the logos of the services that, uh, that I'll be mentioning. Uh, so the first one is the youth club. Um, and uh, this is kind of a flagship um, uh, uh, service because it allows young persons to come across and meet other LGBT plus young persons. We know that there's a high level of isolation and loneliness amongst LGBT plus young persons. So this is really, really helpful for them to, to access and, uh, and realize and meet other LGBT plus young persons. And uh, there's an image now that shows, about, uh, shows our summer camp and winter retreat, uh, because those are the programs specifically designed for young persons who might not be able to attend youth club on a regular basis. Uh, so those, um, services have been designed to make sure that the access is facilitated for the young persons who are who would have otherwise been beyond the reach of the organization. Um, we also run Pride Prom, which is our uh, biggest annual event. It's a golden, <laughs> uh, very um, retro um, logo. Uh, it kind of depicts the, the service that was designed by young persons for young persons. They told us that they don't want to go to the school prom because they felt that it was a space where they were oppressed or not able to go in the gender that they identify with or with the partner that they have. So um, they asked us to run a queer version, which, well, we did. I was, what could possibly be difficult? Little I know. But, um, Anyways, courageous, uh, world belongs to the courageous, I suppose. Um, out of that, we developed the, another event because the young persons came back and said, why do we have only one a year, uh, which is homoing. And it's a picture of a, of a ghost behind the screen um, uh, because it's Halloween for homos, essentially. It's a pun and I've been told it's not inclusive of trans persons. And I spoke to my trans members and they were like, yeah, we get this a pun, stop being, um, uh, stop being annoying. Um, so that's what they told us. Um, Showcase um, is an event that we run every year to showcase the work we do at the center and we're, we are all, we are all invited, it's an open event. Uh, it's for young persons to have an opportunity to talk and discuss um, how the organization works with uh, with their needs. We will do inclusion work in schools. We also do culture club because culture is quite important for us as an organization. Um, um, strategically, because it's, we do a lot of our things to theaters and performances. Um, we do social action for young persons. Uh, and that's a picture that shows a hand that um, has got social action and all the different um, aspects of social action and activism um, in it. We also run yoga class now, as well as the drug academy. And we also started doing work placement programs um, just before the lockdown, so we didn't kind of help the matters. Uh, we're looking to relaunch that to allow our young persons to build their employability skills. And we offer now uh, counseling as well as mentoring services as a um, uh, response to the impact of pandemic on people's mental health. So you can see that all of those services, if I was to kind of compartmentalize them, they would fit into support, educate, and inspire. And a lot of our youth club work, even though it's a youth club and it's a peer support, uh, and peer network, it also fits into the uh, broader remit of education because uh, it does have its curriculum. So we work on a curricular basis. Uh, so every week there's a different workshop that young persons participate in, uh, which aims to basically educate them uh, into LGBT plus uh, understanding uh, of community building essentially. So um, the methodology that we use is quite interesting. So we use the new theory of well-being, which is the positive psychology, which is PERMA methodology. So the image now on the screen shows uh, four letters, P, E, R, M, and A in round circles. Uh, and they stand for P being for positive emotions. And if you think about the service that I just discussed, I think that's if you think about working with LGBT plus young persons, you might want to use that. Uh, so positive emotions is about creating this positive experiences. You mentioned Culture Club, I've mentioned Track Academy, I mentioned Showcase, having those, we see ourselves as being curators of memories essentially for the young persons and um as, as cheesy as it might sound um 
E stands for engagement. So we believe in flow. Uh, it, there's something about working with young person's strengths and assets. And I think that's what is quite important. Uh, R for, stands for uh, having positive relationships. And that means creating the environment where young persons can form peer relationships with each other, but also having mentoring team. Uh, so our amazing volunteers who are there to support, uh, educate and inspire LGBT plus uh, young persons for the, throughout their uh, relationships. Uh, meaning, so we are working, uh, in terms of meaning, we work with, obviously I mentioned LGBT plus community and giving young persons um, uh, opportunity to um, kind of have those values um, and, and kind of carry them out in practical sense. So we do also have got the social action where the young persons have volunteered many projects um, to support the LGBT plus community. And one thing they did where they, they were educating uh, older LGBT plus community and using social media, which was then which was supported as a blessing before the lockdown happened. And A is for accomplishments. And this is where the showcase is uh, a great opportunity for us to say thank you to all, um, uh, all of our amazing young persons who actually come in and, and do all this amazing work and take part and uh, and create those um, opportunities. So I think if you think about it, you know, it's about kind of having the journey and encouraging young persons to kind of go through the journey and making sure that all those elements are being met, because then their well-being is kind of a, a result of that um, approach. If you have all of those indicators are being met and think about your own organizations, are the young persons having a positive emotions associated with your organization? Are they feeling oppressed? Are they having positive relationships? Or is a member of staff being abusive and refusing to call them by their chosen gender pronoun? Whatever the case might be, think about it in that regard and, and because every single missing element will have an impact on their well-being. Um, I'm going to briefly mention privilege and oppression because I refer to it in my tips, uh, which is my last slide, you'll be happy to hear, Sally, because um, this is going on a lot, a lot. Um, but I'm very conscious of time. Uh, so we use the wheel of, uh, of power and privilege as an example to um, into less understanding of, of uh, where the, the, the privilege is and where the oppression is. So this is the power uh, comes with privilege and that's kind of the more central you are on many of those uh, different characteristics, the more power you have and therefore the more privilege you have uh, because your power originates from privilege. Um, and I think that there's a lot of phrases around, around spoken about things like, oh, you know, be mindful of your privilege. And yes, being mindful is one element of it, but there's something else about it. And we say to our members when we talk about privilege is that this is your, um, superpower, right? So what you can do is to utilize the privilege to pull in people and make sure that their voices are being heard at the center of the power who are being oppressed on the same axis as your, um, um, at the, on the same axis as your um, form of um, oppression as it were. Uh, so that is exactly what, um, uh, just randomly stopped working, so. <laughs> Um, so um, that's exactly what I'm talking about, pr privilege and, and, uh, and oppression. I think when we're talking about privilege and oppression, I think if we start realizing that actually you have the power to stop uh, things. Um, uh, Lila, is that, are, you, are you okay? Are you telling me off to be like, uh, are you telling me to stop now? Can I just do the last slide? I'm just, I'm just finishing now. I've got two more minutes. Are you just like nodding? Um, okay, so um, the last thing I'm going to mention are some tips on inclusion and I think when, it, when we talk about LGBT plus inclusion and this obviously this is a very again very broad application because you all might be in schools organizations and so on so um, obviously make sure that your policy is in line because um, that's what organization has to follow in terms of internal policies um, actively explore anti-oppressive practice in your meetings and make sure that you are investigating anti-oppressive practice uh, challenge assumptions so if your colleagues make assumptions about someone just be like well how do you know this do you do you know this did they tell you this did they tell you how they would like to be addressed for instance uh, support social transitions and I think it's quite important people ask you to change their name on the record just change their name on the record like it's really not that deep um, I think I have had so many head teachers calling me and asking oh what am I going to do with this young person who wants to be called a different name just call them a different name like surely this is quite important for people to be referred to how they would like to be referred to. Um, help the new arrivals, we have we work with refugees and asylum seekers and it's very important that they are being directed to LGBT sp spaces so that they can build the case for their for the claim. Um, um, insist on the self-determination again within the kind of broad organization um, is quite important. Use your privilege to kind of support people who are being oppressed. Obviously I'm cis so I can support trans people and kind of making sure that they're being brought in and their voices are being heard. Um, 
be aware of targeted services around you because there's a need for LGBT specific targeted support um, and they serve a little bit different um, uh, function than some of the LGBT plus support groups in schools. Learn and make mistakes. I give you permission to make mistakes. Like it's okay. Like as long as you are trying to make a difference, it's okay for you to make a mistake, right? It's fine. The worst that you can do is to just sit back and be like, I'm not going to say anything because I'm afraid I might say something wrong. That's the last we want. Uh, so if someone, if you if you try to do something good and it backfired, call me and I'll 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 help you out. Um, uh, lead by example is very simple one, uh, and prevention is better than cure. Make sure that you educate people and prepare them. And coming out is not a safeguarding concern. The just child telling you they are gay, lesbian, or trans doesn't mean that they have to call the parents and let them know. Um, and visibility, I'm putting last because very often people slap rainbow um, uh, images on everything and they're like, we're inclusive now. No, that's not how it works. The visibility comes last. Like you have to do a lot of work before you're allowed to display, uh, display a, a rainbow, preferably train your stuff as well. Um, and last but not least, how many homophobes does it take to change a light bulb? None, they fear change, even if it means making the world a brighter place. Over and out. Sully, apologies for overrunning if I did. Oh, two minutes. Well, I think I've done well, considering that we were overrunning. Thank you so much, Lukash. I mean, you're, you're, it's very thorough. And I think it's really good to have like this step by step and really practical advice and looking at it from the emotional and well being point of view. It's, it's really, really good. I think on, in October, I'm going to give you like a two hour workshop where people can really come and, and learn from you because what you're doing is phenomenal. I know you're supporting over 300 LGBTQ plus young people. Um, Nick is saying, um, that another South East London based, based LGBTQ plus targeted services that Metro Charities Youth Group. Yes, um, yeah. you're very welcome to, to, to share that with, with everybody. Uh, Natasha is saying completely agree. Thank you, Lukas. So feel free to pop in any questions you may have in the Q&A and then people can type their answers. So we had a look at out of school support and we really wanted sports. Um, to be featured. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome Sally and Lou, if you'd like to introduce yourself and tell us about your... Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, we can and we can see. Yeah. If you could describe the image, we've got uh, uh, blind people in the audience. Thank you so much. Okay, I will do that. So uh, thank you for inviting us to come along today. Uh, Lucas, very jolly presentation. Thanks for uh, lifting the mood brilliantly. Um, so my name's Sally Carr and I've got an MBE after my name and I've joined the campaign to change the honours. Uh, and whilst I'm talking about honours, can I just pay great respect to Isaac Blake who's participating today for all his incredible work that he's doing about Gypsy Roma Traveller, LGBT plus people, access and inclusion. So I'm the director of youth at Pride Sports and I'm uh, always absolutely awestruck by uh, the great director Lou Englefield who will uh, introduce herself. Hi, I'm Lou Englefield. Um, I'm a fellow director of Pride Sports and uh, we're an LGBTIQ plus sports development and inclusion organisation based in England. Absolutely. Thanks, Lou. And I'll just describe our slides. They're on a, a, a beautiful purple background with the inclusive rainbow swirl. Uh, and we have <clears throat> a few words that I'll read out. And when we've got images, I'll describe the images. Uh, I'm going to hand over to Lou for this first slide, just to give us a little background and context of Pride Sports, please. OK, um, so Pride Sports was founded in 2006. Um, we were the first and still one of only three organisations in the UK that work solely um, to challenge LGBTIQ plus phobia in sport and physical activity and to promote access to sport and physical activity for LGBTIQ plus people. Um, so we aim to challenge LGBTIQ plus phobia in sport and improve um, and improve participation. And in working towards these goals, we campaign for change, educate, promote good practice, and and eventually, ultimately, to actively grow LGBTIQ plus participation and satisfaction in sport. 
Sally, do you want me just to say a quick bit here about why we're interested in PE? Yeah. OK, so oh, we're yeah. pati we're particularly interested in um, PE um, school PE and school sport uh, for a couple of reasons. Uh, one, our experience of working with LGBT IQ plus young people over a number of years shows us that school PE can be a traumatizing place for young people. Um, young people talk to us regularly, for example, about um, navigating the horror of the changing rooms to get through to um, a, a safe space to take part in, in uh, physical activity. Some research we did in 2017 for Sport England showed that um, it, um, against a control sample of the general population who scored um, school PE in sports, 7.6 out of 10, um, lesbians um, and bi people uh, scored 5.5, uh, trans people scored 5.4, gay men scored 4.3, and other groups, so pan, people who identified mainly as pansexual, asexual and queer, scored school sport and PE only 3.9. Um, Sport Wales uh, brought out some research recently um, around um, their, their school sports survey and for the first time ever gave young people the, the, the opportunity to identify something other than male or female. And that has thrown up some incredible data um, that shows that not only are young people who identify as something other than male or female significantly less likely, likely to be active, but they're loads less likely to enjoy PE a lot. And I could go on and on and on, but the key thing is that we know that there's a strong link between negative experiences of school PE and participation in sport and physical activity in later life. So working with young people is absolutely critical. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks so much, Lou. Thank you for that. And that gives a, a beautiful <clears throat> summary of the slide, <clears throat> which has got a very nice photograph on of some young people at one of our Pride Sports events that uh, as Pride Sports we do in partnership. And as Lou was talking then about um, young people's experiences of sport, we have been creating some guidance for out of sport activities for LGBTIQ young people. And this is because young people don't exist in a vacuum. They exist in society, in school, in families, in community and broader. And we recognize that by making environments embracing um, for people, people are more likely to have positive outcomes. And this has resonated from the young people we've consulted with and the adult sports leaders we've consulted in who run uh, LGBTIQ plus sports groups and what came through very uh, loudly from those consultations was a need for to feel safe and included not to feel alone to feel empowered uh, that everybody's included and we do things together and that has come through time and time again and really important that's really a brief summary of, of that slide that has got uh, some uh, speech marks in it for uh, people so I'll give that description. So we're creating this guidance for out of school sport because we recognise that in school sport remains, as Lou has highlighted, a hostile environment for many LGBTIQ plus young people. The cis and not and the cis and tra um, het normative uh, of school still remains very loudly. I've just come here from the diverse diversity in education conference where uh, teachers were talking, and this came across very loudly. Um, our colleagues up at Leap Sports in Scotland have produced this wonderful six-step approach for school PE. And I don't think the asks on it are massive, actually. They are embracing. And if you embrace all students and you, and you take time to make that appreciative inquiry with people about what they want and you include the students in making the possibilities happen, then I don't think the task can be, is that arduous. And what you'll uh, end with is something that is significant. And I'll show you a slide at the very end. So on this slide is the, is the guide, the charter from Leap Sports set out against six colours uh, and is accessible on their website. Ultimately, it's about people feeling included. And we are creating at Pride Sports this four stage approach for our guidance for LGBTIQ plus adult sports groups to set up junior sections. We took inspiration from the race guide 
that has the must do, could do, should do and could do section. And we've added in a nice to do section. It isn't about uh, having a, con a focus on elite, uh, being an elite athlete. It's about a, a focus that is mixed that brings in these aspects of emotional and community, and social and spiritual wellness of everybody involved. Our guidance is achievable uh, and will be launched in July, but it's about uh, creating an anchoring of safeguarding throughout it, paying attention to young people's welfare and providing the support scaffolding around them so that they feel involved and they can uh, thrive within those adult groups. Because what we know is that this research from the Trevor Project in the US said this, that in a survey of over 17,000 uh, young people, right? That's a lot of school dinners, 17,000. The attainment of LGBTQ plus young people who were involved in sport was 11% higher, 11% higher than their non-sporting peers. And you see this embracing culture, a sense of teamwork, a sense of support, a sense of belonging, wanting to achieve together. It comes through really strongly. And interestingly enough, what the project also revealed was that um, that for youth population generally, the inclusion in sport adds a 2% increase to attainment. So for LGBTQ plus young people, this is significant, absolutely significant. Um, so our guidance will come out at the end of June and it does complement um, work that is already uh, going on, but it extends it because there is that gap between school sport and then adult uh, LGBTQ plus sport. And we want to embrace that because we know that this, the, the experience that students have in school could be far more positive than it is, and it will take them then through their futures and into life. So it's not just about being in the stages of, of being young, it is about projecting forward into adulthood and having that scaffolding around young people. Lou, do you want to say any more? No, I think you've summed it up perfectly, and I think we're on 12.30, so. I know, it's amazing. <laughs> Great. And we haven't got told off, have we? We've done all right. <laughs> Thank you so very much. It was really, really good, actually. And I think when you think about sports, it's what increases your well-being. So it, it's it's just unbelievable that people are feeling excluded from an activity that can improve their mental health. I mean, it's just absolutely shocking. Um, there's quite a lot of questions that were put, but um, yesterday we had Emma Fay, the education director from justlikeus.org, um, who surveyed 3,000 young LGBTQ plus people in the UK about the impact of the pandemic. The data is shocking, but you can use that to make the case within your organization for the need to improve well-being. Because at the end of the day, um, if you're feeling good, you're going to learn. Simple. So, um, Lukash, I'd like to thank you so very much for um, sharing the work of your organization. Um, it's been an absolute pleasure to have you on. Lou and Sally, um, good to see you, Lou, again. And Lou, good to meet you officially, because I've heard you on Clubhouse and I've been following you on social media, but it's nice to actually put the face to the name. 